This is a lesson on the definition of work in the unit for work and energy. I wanted to start with an overview of the types of energy. This is following a lesson on state functions and conservation laws where I talk about those concepts as well as introduce the importance of thinking about an initial and final state in the problems as we move forward. So keep that in mind. Uh, we will also cover kinetic energy and potential energy. These are types of energies, energy of motion and energy of location. Those are in future lectures. This lecture will focus on how to calculate work, which is energy transferred to another object in the form of forces. There are multiple ways to do work on a system, but this is one, is a force on a system. Light is also a form of energy, and that is left for future units. Energy is a scalar quantity. There's no direction associated with it, right? When you eat your breakfast in the morning, it, doesn't, it gives you energy, but it doesn't have a direction, right? Like, you get to decide that. So energy is a scalar, and I know my experiences with students that they come from forces into this unit or momentum into this unit and forget that energy is a, a scalar and want to do vector things on this quantity. So watch out if you catch yourself doing that. The units is joules, which is a Newton times meter. And we know that a Newton can be reduced down to more basic units, which is a kilogram meter per second squared times another meter will give us this meter squared. So joules is the SI unit for energy. You may see it in other forms. For instance, when you move forward in the curriculum, you get to electron volts. That's a form of energy. Um, but joules is SI. Work done by a constant force is a pretty easy equation. You can see the calc-based version over here, which I'm not covering, but I wanted to introduce to you that in the calc-based version of this, when we conceptualize work done by a force, we don't limit that force to be constant, right? Force is a function of the displacement, of the position. And for example, we get a spring, right? The force from a spring is negative k delta x where there's this displacement vector and that's a that it depends right this force for a spring depends on this and that's not the case we're going to be looking at for the work done by a constant force we want this force to be changing at no time it's not changing at all and f in here is the magnitude of that force which will be constant for the situation you're looking at D is the displacement due to the force. If there's a force acting, there should be displacement happening. And this is different, I know, from an everyday experience where you think of work as expending energy. So for instance, if I push against the wall all day, I will feel tired as if I have expended energy and I have with my muscles. But technically, I did zero work on the wall because it did not move. Okay, so watch out for this displacement and also these conceptions that you bring in about these topics as we formalize them into the physics uh, sense. Finally, the last term in here has to deal with the angle. And this angle is between the force vector and the displacement vector. And you can see that is a relic of the original calc-based uh, equation here is that these are vectors and they point in space, right? And so the angle between those two vectors is very important. If they're in the same direction, if they're opposing, if they're at any other angle, that will be something we'll key in on. And I created a whole slide just to talk about this because it is one of the more important ideas when we look at work done by a force and which forces we really pay attention to and which ones we disregard because the work done is irrelevant. And just to highlight, it's the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector, not just any angle given in the problem. So make sure you're thinking about what this angle is and which two vectors you're looking at. So the sign of work, the sign of the work comes from this angle. And it represents, is energy being added to or taken away from the system? If I have energy added to the system, there will be positive work. If I have energy taken away from the system, there will be negative work.
and it's related to the angle. So I was drawing a block here. Let's see. If I just have a block sitting on a table, I have a normal force and I have a weight. Let's imagine that there is a friction force and we're moving it along in the direction and maybe there's some sort of applied force here. And I will assign a coordinate system. Um, and more importantly though, not so much a coordinate system, but that the displacement vector, right? Because that's the vector that we really care about. The displacement vector I'll put in this direction. And we can see, for instance, we have an applied force causing motion in this situation. And the angle is typically between negative 90 and positive 90, somewhere in the direction of the displacement, right? They're going in the same direction. So when I look at that, this applied force and this displacement vector, the angle between them will be this, whatever this angle here, right? And I will get a positive sign of the work out of it. The cosine of some angle between negative 90 and 90 is a positive value. The friction force in here opposes the motion. So on our sort of intuition, if a force opposes the motion, it should do negative work. It's taking energy away from the system. Well, this comes out in the sign. In order to find the work done by that friction force, I would need a cosine 180 degrees. Well, cosine 180, if you have that memorized or plug it into your calculator, is a negative 1. And we see how in the equation we get a negative 1 out of here, which causes the overall work to be negative for the friction force. And notice that the angle I put in for the work for the force applied, this angle, is different than this angle. Each force will have a different angle. And that's why I set up here the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector, not just any angle in the problem, right? Here we have 180, and that's not an angle usually given in the problem. So watch out for that. Notice that the normal force and then the weight here are perpendicular to the motion, right? The displacement in this is in this direction. Normal force and weight are perpendicular to it. And as you can imagine, those two forces are not contributing to the, for the forward displacement, right? They're perpendicular to it. They're not adding to it. They're not taking away from it. So when I look at the angle for those two forces, that's 90 degrees. And when you do cosine 90 degrees, well, that equals zero. So even though the force has a magnitude and the displacement has a magnitude, the angle is 90, and so we get zero overall for that term. And you can save yourself some math and calculation if you notice that there's forces that don't contribute to the motion or take away from the motion. You may not even include them in your calculations. So I chose uh, the pulling the sled problem as a simple example just to get an idea of how to use the work equation. So we have Carrie pulling a sled along a snowy horizontal path with a 595 newton force directed at an angle above the ground. And it says draw a free body diagram for the sled as it's being pulled. Okay, so you can do a general sketch here, like here's maybe a sled and here's Carrie pulling it. I will call that F Carrie. Um, there's a normal force, I'm sure, and a weight. And I can do this over here so that we can um, have a true free body diagram. I will call this F carry. Here's the normal force. Here's the weight. I'm not sure if there's a friction force. In real life, there's friction between um, an object and the snow. So I will put it in there, but I don't know what the value is. Um, so that would be a free body diagram. On this free body diagram, and what you're seeing is I'm going to need to pay attention to the displacement vector. You will probably assign a coordinate system, which is fine, but we really want to identify that displacement vector. So I'm going to put the displacement vector in there. I'm going to draw a coordinate system. You may feel comfortable drawing an acceleration vector in there. I'm fine. I don't know if she's speeding up or slowing down. It doesn't say, so I might hesitate in this situation. But if it's clear, you could add it. And that would give you a good free body diagram. So that's part A. 
part B says if she pulls the sled over a distance of 44 meters. Okay, so I have a distance of 44 meters. I have a force. I have a mass. I have a 33 degrees. So I have some information going on. It says how much work has Carrie performed on the sled? Okay, so for part B, if I want to find the work done by Carrie, I'm going to have to take the force from Carrie, multiply by the displacement, vector, the magnitude of the displacement, and then also cosine of the angle between them. In this situation, the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector is the angle given in the problem. Okay, so I'm okay with that, 33 degrees. Uh, they give me F carry, they give me the displacement, so I'm going to plug those numbers in. 595 is the force from carry. The displacement, the distance traveled, is 44, and cosine 33. When you plug this through your calculator, you get the work done by carry is 22,400 joules. It's rounded off a little bit there. There was three sig figs, two sig figs up here. I'm fine with that number. And I'm going to make it just a little bit nicer to read. You may see things in kilojoules. And so that's a, just a factor of a thousand, right? I divide by a factor of a thousand, I can get kilojoules. So that's how to use just the basic equation of how do you find the work done by a force? Fd, cosine of the angle between them. When we look in more detail on work of a system, work on a system, the net work on a system, right? We have multiple forces going on. You saw that in the carry example, there were multiple forces. And you can imagine you've drawn free body diagrams with forces going places, right? And how we're gonna deal with this is similar to how we dealt with the net force on a system is we just added up all the forces. This is formally called the principle of superposition, and that may be a vocabulary term that you want to keep a hold of, principle of superposition. And we just kind of add the things together. That's what the principle of superposition is, is like a set of fancy words for saying we just add everything together and it's fine if we do that. And this works for vectors and scalars, right? Because force is a vector. When we look at work, work is a scalar. Energy is a scalar quantity, work is a scalar, and we're just going to add all those works up. So the work of one force plus the work of the other plus 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 will get the network on the system. And remember, we can find the work of a force by using Fd cosine theta. So I chose a couple of problems in order to exemplify these concepts a bit more as we apply them. A shopper pushes a grocery cart, okay, so we're used to this situation, at a constant speed, I'm going to note the change in speed here is there's no change in speed it's a constant speed on level ground against a friction force he pushes on in a direction 25 degrees below the horizontal and it says draw a free body diagram of the cart okay I was going to do that anyway because I need to kind of encode the problem and get a picture out on the paper to help me think about it so let's draw a shopping cart here and I'm not going to draw the wheels I'll just make it look like a box um, the shopper is pushing down and forward onto the cart there's a better I'll call that FS for F shopper. And I can put theta in here. There's that angle theta. Well, it's a shopping cart. There's going to be the floor holding it up with a normal force. There's going to be a weight downward, uh, which I'm not given the weight or the mass of the shopping cart. I'm going to assume that I don't need it. And then the last thing I'm going to put in here is the force from the friction. OK. Uh, let's add a displacement vector. Remember, a displacement vector is going to be something that we'll want to reference. And we can add a coordinate system in here just in case. And it's at constant speed, so I'm going to go ahead and put A equals 0 up here just so that I can remember that um, it's constant speed. So uh, there's the free body diagram of the grocery cart. Part B asks, what is the total work done on the cart? And I know probably what you're thinking. Sarah introduced on the previous slide, I take all the force, the work by all the forces and add them up. But I want to hesitate here for a second and go back to that constant speed term. 
When you think about something moving at constant speed, what does that say about the energy into and out of the system? If it's at constant speed, it's not speeding up. I'm going to assume it's not rising in temperature or anything that says that it's gaining energy. So I'm going to say that the total work done, work net, equals zero. And that's because of the constant speed. Constant speed. So uh, we're going to keep that in mind. And that's the answer to part B, is there's no work done. And that has to do with the constant speed. So as we're looking forward, the next part says calculate the work done by each one of these forces. OK, so this is an activity just to calculate. How do you calculate this one? How do you calculate? The, OK, so we're going to go through and do this. I'm going to start with part C up here. Part C says the work done by the friction. So work done by the friction is going to be the friction force times the displacement times the angle between those two. Well, the distance is to the right here and the friction force is to the left for me and so the angle between them is 180 degrees and we kind of had that suspicion is that friction will be taking energy away from this system so I'm gonna plug values in here the friction force is 35 the distance is 20 meters and cosine of 180 is negative 1 so I get the work done by friction is negative 700 joules. And you can do your units in here to make sure your dimensional analysis works out to joules. Um, force times meters, newtons times meters, that's a joule. So there's the answer for part C, the work done by friction. Let's keep going. Part D says the work done by the gravitational force. Well, let's write this out. The work done by gravity equals the force of gravity times the distance covered times cosine of the angle between the displacement and the weight. All right. So the weight force is the gravitational force. And we can see there that it's 90 degrees. And I'm not even going to plug in numbers here. I'm just going to note that 90 degrees is 0. Uh, cosine 90 degrees is 0. So I get the work done by gravity is 0. I expected that. It's not contributing to the motion. It's not taking away from the motion. And we're actually going to see this again for the normal force. Part E says the normal force. We're going to get the normal force times the distance traveled, cosine 90 degrees. And you could get particular, well, which one's negative 90 and which one's positive 90 here. Uh, the, bottom, the bottom line is that they're both zero joules. Both of those are not contributing to the work of the system. So it says calculate the work done by the shopper. Here's the problem, and you can see down here it says find the force that the shopper exerts. We don't know the force the shopper exerts. But what I'm going to remind you is that we already know the net work done, right? We already know that the net work done is zero. We have the work done by the other forces, and so we can kind of do this backwards inference into the network has to equal the work done by the shopper plus the work done by the friction force plus the work done by gravity plus the work done by the normal force. Of course, we're going to leave these two out because they're zero, but I wanted to put them in there to be formal about it, right, to build this whole thing. Energy is a scalar. Add them all in. We're going to note that a couple of them is zero. So I can put a zero here, the work done by the shopper, is something we don't know. The work done by the friction force is negative 700. So we're going to see that the work done by the shopper is a positive 700 joules. And I'm going to go ahead and make a note that this is positive 700 joules. When you're dealing with scalars, it, it, they're assumed to be positive, but we're seeing that that's not the case. We need to really keep track whether we're adding energy to the system and have a positive sign and an energy taken away from the system with a negative sign. If you've done chemistry before this point, you will see this with chemistry. When there's heat being added and taken away, endothermic and exothermic, you have to keep track of the sign of that energy, whether it's into the system or out of the system. For part G, we can get the definition of work out. Now that we know how much work the shopper does, 700 joules, we can get the definition of this out. 
cosine of the angle between them. Well, the shopper is at an angle here, um, and that's the 25 degrees, so I'm going to put that in here too. Okay, so we're solving for the force of the shopper equals the work of the shopper over the distance traveled cosine 25. So I get 700 divided by 20 cosine 25. And that number, when you run it through your calculator, will be 38.6 newtons. If we had the mass, we could maybe find the coefficient of friction between the wheels and the floor, right? But that's what they asked us for. What's the uh, force of the shopper? So there's two ways to calculate force you're seeing is just to go ahead and use the definition, but then this shows us that we can use an inference that we know if we know how much the net work is, we can find a subpart of that work. The last problem I've chosen is a vertical problem. I wanted to show how to do vertical problems. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, read the problem here and get oriented. The first thing it wants here is a free body diagram. So a 73 kilogram person in an elevator is accelerated upward from rest to a speed of 2.3 meters over a distance of 8 meters. Draw a free body diagram for the person during the acceleration. Okay, so specifically they want the person in here. I'm going to draw a tall box for a person. Uh, if they're standing in the elevator, they will have a normal force, and because they're near the surface of the earth, they will have a weight. Um, you can call that Fn and Fg if you'd like. I call them N and W for normal and weight. The displacement vector, remember if we're working with work, we want to identify the displacement vector. I'm going to put the displacement vector upward. It says it accelerates upward. Uh, I'm also going to assign a coordinate system. The coordinate system, I will let positive y be upward. And I'm also going to make a note that the acceleration is upward. So it's speeding up. If the acceleration and the displacement vector are in the same direction, they speed up. I'm also going to note that there's a distance here. I might, if I were like drawing a general sketch, I might note in a general sketch that there's an initial here, right? Y equals zero for an initial height. And then it moves up to Y final equals eight. And I can have an initial and final sort of a sketch going on with a V final and a V initial, V initial equals zero. And that would be my maybe an, a sketch, whereas this is the free body diagram here. So there's the free body diagram. It says calculate the work done by each force during the motion, including sine. Okay, so if I want to calculate the work done by the weight, that seems pretty easy. Um, the work done by gravity is going to be the weight force times the displace, the distance traveled and then cosine of the angle between the displacement vector and the weight vector, which I'm gonna note in this situation, displacement is up, weight is down, so I get 180 degrees here. So it um, takes energy away. So I know this weight is mg. I'm gonna note that weight is mg and so I get 73 times 9.8. The distance traveled is 8 meters and then cosine 180 is a negative 1. When I run these through the calculator, I get a value, weight done, work done by gravity is negative 5723 joules. I get a negative value. And of course I expected that because of the negative sign here. Okay. So we're getting about negative 6,000 joules for that. Calculating the work done by the normal force, I would need the normal force. Cosine. I'm going to go ahead and put the angle in here. The angle between the displacement vector and the normal vector is zero. So I'll put that in there. But we need that normal force value need the normal force value. How would I find the normal force value? Well, given what I have, normal force, I could do maybe a free body diagram with force analysis, right? I already have the free body diagram. If I do the net force equals ma, I would get the normal force up 
minus the weight down has to equal mass times the acceleration. Well, I'm going to have to work just for a second to find the acceleration. Um, let's see. The acceleration is from rest to 2.3. So I think I would use this equation, v final squared e equals v initial squared plus 2a delta x. I solve that equation for a. I get v final squared divided by 2 delta x. So you could find that value in here. And I'm going to plug it in. Okay. So the normal force equals, um, remember weight equals mg. So I'm going to get ma plus mg, which will equal, I'm going to factor a mass out v final squared over 2 delta x plus g. When you plug these values through your calculator, I didn't um, calculate acceleration. You could do that on the side and then plug it in here. When you calculate, when you run all of those through your calculator, you get 739.54 newtons. So that's what I'm going to plug in for the normal force value in the equation here. So when I plug this in, I get 739.54 times the distance traveled, 8 meters, cosine 0 is 1, and I get the weight, the work done by the normal force is plus, it's a positive value, it's adding energy to the system. It's actually the force causing the acceleration, causing the motion upward. So it gets a positive value, and it is 5 thousand nine hundred and sixteen point one eight five joules. That's the work done by the normal force. So we did that. There's no other forces. Calculate the work done by each force, including signs. So we have signs, we have the work. What is the net work done on this person over the distance? Well, the net work done, this is pretty easy. It will be the work done by gravity plus the work done by the normal force. Well, I can plug these in, 5916.185 minus 5723.2, and the net work I get to be just a small value here, 193.085 joules, and that will be the net work. This is a pretty straightforward problem. And notice how I'm taking you through steps, step by step by step. We're going to streamline this procedure by conceptualizing it a little bit different. But this lesson was intended to teach you how to find work done by a force and also how to relate work done by individual forces to that network on the system.